Well, good morning. And let me start by saying that sometimes an extraordinary human crisis like COVID-19 uh, brings people together to accomplish extraordinary things. And uh, I would say that this morning is really about that. So let me start uh, with a, uh, a conversation that I had with Reverend Anthony, uh, who is a, a dear friend of mine and also, as you know, a tremendous uh, community leader. Uh, several weeks ago, I contacted him uh, one evening and uh, started to talk to him about all the great things that DT Energy uh, was doing in the community as it relates to assisting our customers, especially those that are low income and vulnerable like senior, seniors, to make sure that they had access to energy. And um, as we were both reflecting on that and understanding how important that was, he said, you know, there is a time when corporate CEOs like yourself and other foundation CEOs and other community partners need to get together and do something really fundamental uh, that I'm worried about. And I said, well, Reverend, tell me a little more. And he said, well, look at um, school is about to be canceled here in Michigan. And I'm really deeply concerned that the children of Detroit are going to fall further behind uh, because they do not have access to digital equipment to continue their learning from home. So he said it would be really tremendous if you could bring a group of leaders together in this community uh, to make that happen. So as a result of that conversation today, we mark a defining moment in the history of Detroit Public Schools and the city itself. Uh, the COVID-19 outbreak really has highlighted uh, the inequities that exist in both our city and urban areas across the country. And that inequity that we're talking about today is really what we've come to call uh, the uh, digital divide uh, between children in urban centers uh, and in the rest of our community. In Detroit, only 10% of our students have access to devices uh, or broadband access. That is a problem even in the best of times. When we're asking to learn from home, that problem becomes even more acute. By all measures, the city of Detroit needs to move on this because it's not acceptable. Today, we're announcing that a coalition of businesses and philanthropic organizations, together with Detroit Public Schools, will invest $23 million uh, to close this digital divide in our K-12 through Detroit Public Schools program. These devices will allow students to access their homework and school studies from home. They will digitally connect students with their teachers and allow them to continue learning during the important summer months when many students lose ground. This access will not only help students, but it will open up a world of opportunity to their families from online job applications to workforce development. When Detroit's forced with a big issue, we respond with a big answer. And I'm humbled by the response uh, that has happened in, in our community to, to rally for this problem. Thank you to all of our partners in this initiative who answered the call, and we came to them with the aspiration that all students deserve a level playing field when it comes to education. Especially in today's world, uh, that means that they need to have access to technology. Many of our partners couldn't attend today because of social distancing, but they're critical to the success of this initiative. Early investments by leaders like the Balmer Group and General Motors sets the, set the stage for this work to be possible today. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't thank the W.K. Kellogg Foundation for their commitment and for GM's General Motors continued ongoing support. Now I'll invite Dr. Nikolai Vitti, a Detroit Public Schools Superintendent, to talk about how these devices will be deployed and uh, how we'll make great uh, Great progress with them. Thank you, Dr. Vitti. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Nikolai Vitti, Superintendent of Detroit Public Schools Community District. Uh, this is just an exciting uh, morning time uh, for our students uh, to be able to stand here and say that uh, the business community and our nonprofit community immediately stepped up to fill a gap that has been ongoing in our community. Uh, regarding the digital divide. Uh, as you know, the governor made the right decision uh, to, to close schools and move to distance learning. Uh, as a school district, we created that distance learning plan rapidly. Uh, in fact, a lot of our materials are being used throughout Michigan and throughout the country. So our district certainly uh, provided the resources that our teachers 
uh, students and family needed in order to continue learning uh, through the shutdown. Uh, the challenge, as Jerry indicated, is that only about 10 to 20 percent of our families have consistently been able to access a device uh, and or internet access at home. So the materials that were created for online lear learning pre-K to 12th grade, reading, math, science, social studies, including uh, physical education and art, have not been accessible. Uh, so although we printed materials, uh, we started to have a conversation of how can we allow students to not only to learn throughout this shutdown, um, but continue learning uh, into the summer, the fall, and future years to narrow this digital divide that, that has been ever present uh, in the Detroit landscape. The initial conversations uh, was about providing laptops or um, tablets to maybe a hundred, a thousand students. And, and part of my conversation was we have to think about scale. We can't perpetuate the inequality that not only gives throughout the country and in the state, but even within our own city, within our own school district. We have to come up with a scaled solution. And, and I wouldn't be able to make this announcement today if it wasn't for the leadership of Reverend Anthony, who mobilized, rallied, uh, called everyone to action. Ajira uh, Nosia uh, from DTE, Bill Emerson from Quicken Loans, Tanya Allen from Skillman, and the mayor. Everyone played their own individual role to make phone calls, to advocate, to create a plan, not only a short-term but a long-term plan to make sure that this investment goes much, much beyond just providing students with learning over the shutdown. So starting in June, uh, we should be in a place where we'll begin to distribute uh, the tablets uh, and provide internet access for eight, six months. Uh, this will allow uh, learning to, to happen over the shutdown, but it also allows us to think about summer school um, as far as course recovery, uh, adding to face-to-face -face learning. Hopefully, uh, we'll be back to school in the fall after Labor Day as planned, uh, but if uh, students uh, or families are reluctant to come back uh, or employees are reluctant to come back, we can move forward with a blended learning model where perhaps some students are going face-to-face, -face, others at our home. But beyond uh, this, this crisis, what will begin to happen starting next school year is, is requiring mandatory online learning with uh, iReady, which is a reading and math uh, personalized learning platform, uh, SAT prep uh, on the weekdays, on the weekends. In other words, allowing learning to continue beyond the classroom. Nothing will ever replace a teacher. We know that. A teacher is, is a central component to learning, and that face-to-face -face instruction is, is essential. But online learning allows learning to be augmented, supplemented. Uh, and time lost over the summer, time lost on the weekends, time lost on snow days can be recovered through this online learning. The same online learning that happens in suburban America uh, but doesn't happen in consistency in Detroit. So uh, I'm just excited uh, that people stepped up in, with a sense of urgency and a sense of immediacy based on what our children have needed for a long time, but that divide was so clear with this shutdown, and now we're talking about equity. And if we're talking about equity, we're talking about equal opportunity. And if we're talking about equal opportunity, we're talking about children that now have resources and tools to show the world what our children are capable. I'm just excited for them so that they can have the same tools that other children have in other cities. So their potential, their giftedness, their intelligence, their hard work, their perseverance all shines. Thank you, everyone. At this point, Bill Emerson will join us. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Vitti. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bill Emerson. I'm the Vice Chairman of Quicken Loans. And um, here today to um, talk about a little bit, give you guys a kind of a time lapse. Um, obviously, honored and humbled to be here on behalf of the Rock family of companies, Quicken Loans Community Fund, and the Gilbert Fa Family Foundation. I was sitting at home. It was a Saturday night. Um, I was hanging out with my family, putting together a thousand piece monochromatic jigsaw puzzle and frustrated out of my mind and I get a text from my good friend Jerry Norcia and I thought to myself well I could answer that text or I could continue to be frustrated so I decided to answer that text and Jerry and I had a 90 second conversation where he gave me the elevator pitch about what he wanted to try to accomplish here and asked if we would participate figuring out logistically as well as financially. And I said, absolutely, let's get involved. And so we got some of our smart people together with smart people at DTE, 
Detroit Public Schools Community District and, and the Skillman Foundation, and we started to hammer out how exactly could this come together? What logistically needs to happen? How do we get the laptops? How do we make sure it's sustainable? How do we make sure there's, there's accountability around all of this? And as we were doing all that work, um, I started asking myself strategically, how do we fit into this? How do we plug into this? when we think about the millions of dollars and the hundreds of hours we've spent on the COVID-19 response, whether that be forgiving rent for people in, in our buildings or um, figuring out how to set up a testing center at the state fairground with the help of the city uh, and making a decision on to, to do the, the Rocket Mortgage Classic uh, with TV only and how do we make an impact on the city with that. And as, it, as I thought about that and as we talked about it internally, it became crystal clear. This is an opportunity to solve a systemic issue around inequities that have existed within our city for years. And when we thought about that and we pieced that all together, it was an absolute no-brainer for us to not only be there logistically, but to be there financially as well. And what was amazing to see is as we started to socialize this with private entities, the philanthropic community, the city of Detroit, it was amazing to see everybody start to come together and realize that the community of Detroit was all in on making sure that we could not only provide tablets and internet access to the kids of Detroit, but the impact that that would have for families and their ability to access the internet and all the things that are necessary to be done with that. So we had a call on Monday and there were about 60 folks on that call that were possible funders to come into this. And that, first of all, that response was incredible. But second of all, to see what, where we are, where we've come in literally three short weeks from idea concept to the ability to stand here today and announce this out is absolutely 100% amazing. And as I said at the call on Monday, we stand at the doorstep of an opportunity to affect transformational change. And all we have to do now is walk through that doorstep together and, and make it happen. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. So thank you to Jerry Norcia, uh, and DTE, thank you to Dr. Vitti and DPSCD, thank you to Tanya Allen, uh, obviously our folks and, and the mayor at, at being able to come here together and get this done. And with that said, I'm going to hand it off to my good friend and partner in philanthropy uh, on the Skillman Foundation, Tanya Allen. Thank you so much, Bill. <clears throat> my name is Tanya Allen and I serve as the president and CEO of the Skillman Foundation. At the Skillman Foundation, we ask an important question, and that is, and how are the children? The reason we ask this question is because we believe it's an important moral question. We believe it's an important economic question. We believe it's an important equity question. And we also think it's a succession question for our city. So I'm happy to report, because of all of the organizations that you're hearing from today and those who have also signed on to this initiative, we're going to be able to answer that question, and how are the children, by saying our children are faring well. I love this Greek um, proverb that says, a society grows great when it plants a shade tree that they'll never sit under. And that's exactly what we're doing today. So we are uh, essentially committed to making sure that every kid in this city has access to technology and connectivity so that they can uh, access their education, that they can stay connected to people who care deeply about them, uh, and that their families also might be connected to technology and to other resources that are greatly needed. But to do that for all children, it's we're gonna require more than just one project. Uh, it really will require multiple tranches of investment. But this tranche, the Connected Futures Project, is so important. As Dr. Vitti and others have said, it's going to serve 51,000 children. We're going to give our children at Detroit Public Schools Community District a top-of-the-line technology solution. And I'm here to tell you, they deserve it. And I'm so proud that our community has come together to be able to make sure that we're not just responding in the short term, but that we're really responding for the long term. We're going to make sure that our young people are engaged and that they are capable of accessing the world uh, and accessing the academics that they need. Uh, we would not be able to do this if it weren't for the Detroit Public Schools Community District. Dr. Vitti and his team are ready. 
They've been planning for this. And just remember, just a few short years ago, we were an essentially a bankrupt operating school district. But we have a leadership team that is, um, there is no greater leadership team in the country. And they're ready for this. Um, this is gonna expedite, it's gonna accelerate all of the good things that they've done in that school district. Uh, and so we're really grateful that it is really going to be integrated into the uh, education system and uh, that they're going to create greater learning enrichment environment, greater learning, tutoring, access, family school connection, computer literacy. There might be some um, social emotional learning or therapy supports that will be provided. But as you know, technology alone isn't going to solve this. Um, it is about how we use technology as the platform that spurs and increases the pace of all of the things we know that children need. And we're so grateful that we believe this plan is a solid and sustainable one. It could not happen, quite honestly. We can all come together, but the only way that this work really happens in an important and meaningful way is if our students and our teachers engage. And so we know that the teachers at Detroit Public Schools Community District are ready, they've been trained, and we're ready to support parents as well as their children in this process. Um, I also just want to share, uh, as I talked about, this is the first tranche of the investment. Once we close this out, we'll be aiming to do the second tranche of investment. There are 36,000 other children in this city who go to other school districts outside of Detroit Public Schools, and we're already planning to expand support to them. We want all children in this city to win, and we believe that this partnership will make that happen. They will have the tools that they'll need for a 21st century education. They will be able to learn remotely, when, uh, and we also will be creating a model for others in the state to mimic and to marvel at. Lastly, I just would say this. Um, this project is bigger than just our children. It's about closing the digital divide. It's also about showing that our community is greater together. And so we're lifting up a muscle in this community that we've built over many years, that resiliency, um, that persistence, that love, that Detroit love, that we know solves problems. And I'm so grateful to be a part of that problem-solving uh, spirit in this city. And I'm grateful to be in partnership with DTE, with Quicken Loans, uh, with Detroit Public Schools District, with Kellogg Foundation, General Motors, and with the city of Detroit and the leadership of our mayor. So with that, I'm going to turn it uh, to our um, beloved Reverend Wendell Anthony, uh, who uh, has inspired us all to do something great for children. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Let me say good morning to everybody. And let me also say that I'm a hugger. This is hugging time. And one of the reasons that I miss church being in session because we are a hugging, kissing, and embracing church. And we miss that. And everybody here deserves a hug for what they're doing. So consider this a collective hug for our children and for the school district. And let me say this, every now and then, one gets the opportunity to do something much bigger, which will last much longer than even they themselves. This is the historic moment. It is a Kairos moment, as we say, in the community of faith when God has placed a special opportunity to be blessed and to bless Detroit to come together to create order out of chaos. It has been said that it is only during a storm that a tree knows how strong it is. Today we are discovering how strong we can be as a people when we come together as a village. It is hard to believe that what started off as an idea, a suggestion, a challenge even, has now evolved into this reality. This truly is the stuff of which dreams are made. 51,000 school children, Dr. Vitti, and their parents will have access to laptops and the internet. A few weeks ago, this was only a thought in the minds of a very few dedicated people. Now children all around this city 
regardless of economic station, whether they live in poverty, whether they are middle or upper, if you're in this city and if you're a part of the school system, social status or racial status will become more knowledgeable, more prepared, and more competent in the future. Education and information will, brought, will be brought live and in living color right into their homes. Detroit will become a national model of what can be done in various communities of people if the people have a mind to get it done. It is appropriate and inspiring that the model begins in the city of Detroit, Mayor. We continue to be a city of firsts. First, from the auto industry to the music industry. Whether it is labor or religion, we take a back seat to no one in creativity and innovation. As a community advocate and a person of faith, I do believe in miracles. The ability to raise $23 million in such a short time to have an impact for such a long time is indeed miraculous coming out of this mayhem. This is one sure way of defeating COVID-19. The disease may have taken our bodies, but it can never take the spirit out of the city of Detroit. I want to thank every company, every business, every foundation, the mayor, because when I mentioned this to the mayor at a fundraiser a few weeks ago, I whispered in his ear about the fact that we needed to do something like that. He said, go for it. Let's get it done. I'll support it. Whoever you need me to call, I will be on the phone to call them. And he did. And each person that has made this initiative possible, I say to all the companies, firms, and foundations, like Skillman, like Kellogg, like all the others, like Quicken, like DTE, and I have to give credit where credit is due. I have to, I can't shake his hand, but I have to lift up and salute Jerry Norcia and DTE and Nancy Moody for the leadership that they have exemplified in this case. Last year, while we were in Israel, I have to tell this story. Jerry Norcia and I and the governor were visiting the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It's the place where the body of Jesus Christ lay. And for some reason, the three of us found ourselves at that particular tomb praying. We didn't know why we had gotten there and why we were the ones to be in that situation. But as we came out, Jerry Norcia made the comment that, you know, I don't know why we wound up in this situation, but I think it means we're going to do something big. That was last year. Today, Jerry Norcia, we are doing something big. It's called legacy. Today, Governor, we are doing something big. It's called legacy. The children of our city need this. It is historic because it has never been done before. If ever you wondered, companies, foundations, what you should do, just hook up to the connected futures and see all the good that you can do. May God bless all of the children, the Detroit Public School Community District System, the educators, the parents, the IT professionals, and other staff that will lead us into the future. The future is not tomorrow. The future is today. It's now my pleasure to introduce the mayor of the city of Detroit, Honorable Mike Douglas. Mr. Mayor. I have to be the luckiest mayor in America, where most of the country is reeling from a health and economic crisis. The religious and corporate and philanthropic community in Detroit is rallying together to address an inequity that's plagued our children for many years. Uh, and it's, it's remarkable how far we've come uh, in early March uh, I was over one evening at the home of uh, Iris Taylor, the president of the school board, and we were talking to Dr. Vitti, and the conversation was anguishing. The question was, do you shut down the Detroit public schools? And at the time, a number of school districts had already shut down.
but they were Ann Arbor, Rochester, Gross Point, Birmingham, West Bloomfield. And it really illustrated the inequities that face our children every day. These are outstanding school districts. Their online learning is so integrated into their everyday experience, they go home and do their homework on their laptops. They can email their teachers at night. They have all kinds of resources. They were ready to switch over because they were so advanced. But if the Detroit public schools closed, not only do many of our children not have laptops, many don't have broadband. And the teaching system wasn't set up. And this city was facing a choice between the immediate health of our residents and the future of our children. The governor took that choice uh, out of our hands by shutting down the school statewide, which was clearly the right thing to do, but it put us in this terrible problem and that the children of Detroit would fall behind faster in the time of school closing than many other children in the state. And Reverend Anthony had talked to me about this idea and some things you just remember. But it was Friday, March 27th. I got home at 11 o'clock at night after a whole day of dealing with food distribution and testing. I was really tired and I was looking through my mail. And I had a message from Reverend Anthony. And I opened it up. And he had a comprehensive proposal he had laid out to open up Wi-Fi and laptops in the children of Detroit to close this terrible inequity. And I went from being half asleep to wide awake. I started sketching it out. I said, there's no way you could do this for less than 20 or $25 million. How in the middle of what is quickly becoming a severe recession are we going to be able to approach anybody? And that was what was on my mind on Saturday afternoon when the phone rang. And it was Jerry Norcia from DTE. And he said, I've been talking to Wendell Anthony, and I'm looking at his proposal. And he said, I want to know how realistic do you think it is? And I said, the magnitude of this is going to be very challenging. Buying the laptops is the easy part. We have huge sections of the city that don't have access to broadband in their homes. So the laptop doesn't do you any good if you don't solve the connectivity. And even if you solve the connectivity, if the Detroit public schools are not ready to teach in this new mode, you've hooked up to something that doesn't really matter. All of these things, three things would have to happen at once. They'd have to happen quickly, and it would be an enormous financial Lift, do you really think you could get the business and philanthropic community to do it? And Jerry Norcia said to me that day, it's a moral imperative that we do it. He took the lead with the help of Dan Gilbert and Bill Emerson and Tanya Allen and a lot of others to put the money together. I talked to, to Iris Taylor and said, this is, I know you're swamped, but this isn't a small thing, this is real. And what Dr. Vitti has done in a short period of time in starting to transform from traditional leaning to uh, learning to embracing the online learning, I think he's going to advance the Detroit public schools teaching three to five years over the next year. And the thing I said to Jerry Norcia that day was, if you could pull this off, you are doing more than helping the children. These children have parents and older siblings who are looking for jobs, need access to training and openings, and right now they go physically to the eight Detroit at work centers. But if these households had laptops, they could access those jobs and the job training right on site. We can help break the cycle of intergenerational poverty, not just by improving the education of the children, but creating opportunities for their parents. And this summer, we were going to have to cancel our summer jobs program, Go to Detroit's Young Talent, where 8,000 children are work in jobs because we couldn't uh, safely cluster them. But if they had these laptops, we could convert them into online jobs and we could keep our summer jobs program and these children could earn money. You could fundamentally change a lot of the inequities in the system. I just don't know how you can raise 20 or $25 million in the middle of a recession. And I have to say, standing here today, it's like a miracle. Uh, this was Jerry Norcia and his team saying, no matter how bad things are, we have to change the inequities in this community uh, once and for all. And so while he was modest, I don't want there to be any question. This was Reverend Wendell Anthony's vision. He laid it out for us, uh, and this community rallied behind him uh, and followed it. And I think it's going to make a difference uh, to the children of the city for a lot of years to come. 
Uh, and so thank you to everybody who's been a part of it. And now to talk from the standpoint of a parent of one of our children, uh, please welcome Melissa Redmond. Good morning, everyone. I am Melissa Redmond, the proud parent of a student that goes to Paul Robeson Malcolm X Academy. I am also an active parent with DPSCD. I am an advocate for many students. I stand here today to, to say thank you to um, everyone who has put in the work for our children to have computers and to be able to move forward. Um, this has been a challenge for our kids. I'm grateful that this has been able to come along because I feel that no child will be left behind at all, regardless. So I definitely want to thank the community, all of the partnerships, Dr. Nikolai Vitti, Mayor Duggan, Tanya Allen, everyone who played a part in this role on making sure that our children are being able to succeed. Um, and I also want to thank God because he definitely made this happen. Um, the last thing I can say, I see Detroit moving in a light and a vision pushing forward, and I'm grateful for that. Okay, we're going to start to open it up to questions and answers in just a moment once our speakers get in position here. Uh, a couple things to point out is, first of all, uh, today there will be no 2 p.m. press briefing on COVID. Uh, this is our uh, announcement for today. But after this Q&A session, uh, for any reporters who have questions for the mayor about our COVID response here in Detroit, he will stay and answer any questions that you may have. And uh, we can start with uh, questions and answers now. Good morning, Ken Coleman from Michigan Advance. Reverend Anthony, walk me through the chronology. This started about a month ago, three weeks ago, with a call to you from you to Jerry. Well, as I said, it really, the seed for something big started in Israel last year and in our conversation with Jerry. And then uh, it just blossomed. So several weeks ago, I put together a little performer called It Takes a Village. And I just started circulating it to various people. I sent it to DTE, I sent it to GM, I sent it to the mayor, I sent it to Tanya Allen, I sent it to Faye Nelson. I just started sending it to everybody. I sent it to, I sent it to Dan Gilbert, I sent it to Quicken Loans, I sent it to Matt, I just started sending it and see where it would connect. And obviously it began to connect and I followed up with some phone calls. I talked to Jerry. And I talked to Nancy Moody, and Jerry got the spirit, to use a church term. Uh, he got the spirit, and uh, he began to move. I mean, the spirit makes you move. When you get the spirit, you can't stay still. You got to move. And he began to move. And, um, and I mentioned it to the mayor. Uh, and the mayor began, he caught the spirit too, and he began to move and people started connecting. And you know, Tanya Allen always has the spirit, so she was always moving. And, and I sent it, I also said, sent it to Dr. Vitti. I talked to Dr. Vitti on the, on the phone. We talked about it. He acknowledged that this is something that we needed to do. It was a vision that he had had because we need to do online learning and in-home, and what a better time. And so out of this chaos, out of this mayhem of COVID-19, Come something that's legacy for the children of this city. It's going to be here long after we're gone. It positions Detroit like it has never been positioned before. And it's not a competitive thing or not a thing to see who gets credit for what. The children get the credit. The parents get the credit. The city gets the credit for being innovative and creative. 
and for touching the least of these. And so I just want to emphasize this. It's not about any one individual. This thing is bigger than all of us. It's for the children. And I just want to invite everybody who's listening, all the companies, all the foundations, everybody who said they want to be a part of this to join, log in on this, connect to the future, because this is only the beginning. There's still some other things that folk can do. So I hope that kind of touches your, your question. Good afternoon, Larry Sproul of WDIV Local 4. Um, this question is for Dr. Vitti. Vitti, two questions. Um, how important is to have this program here for students in Detroit public schools, and how much would this cost for the families? Sure. Um, so the $23 million, uh, about $17 million will go to the tablet. Uh, this is uh, an iView tablet uh, that is going to be completely aligned and compatible with everything that we're doing in the education space. Uh, reading online uh, programs, math programs, uh, we've invested in, in a new literacy uh, program for students with special needs, for example. Uh, we've been using Khan Academy for SAT. Uh, we've developed a portal system for parents to access to see uh, students' grades, daily attendance. We're going to move all of our forms on that portal. Um, so all of that's going to be compatible to the tablet that, that we'll purchase. Another $6 million uh, goes into the Internet uh, access um, strategy. You know, as, as many people have said today, quite a few of our parents have devices, whether it's an iPhone or an Android. The issue has been a data plan and a device that is compatible to learning. You may have an iPhone or an Android, but that's not necessarily the optimal device to learn on, uh, to read, answer questions, et cetera. Um, so w this initiative allows for six months of free internet access for uh, families. Uh, after that six months, uh, if uh, parents are actively uh, allowing their children to use the device at home, and there's a socioeconomic need, then the school district is going to fund the, uh, the continuation of the internet access program. Um, and then as new families come into DPSCD, uh, we're going to recycle our student laptops uh, and give those to parents as new parents come in or to replace damaged, uh, lost, uh, stolen uh, devices. So that's um, the long-term plan. Uh, when we started this work three years ago, we were at one to six as far as student to device ratio. Uh, going into this fall, uh, we were going to be about one to two. Uh, and, and the laptops are being used in the classroom, primarily from K to eighth grade in reading and math. Next year, this upcoming year, we are investing in laptops for high schoolers. So in the fall, students will be able to bring these devices to school. This allows us to reduce that student to ratio even more uh, and begin to require learning to happen at home through the devices, uh, whether that's on weekdays, weekends, summer. Um, so this is how we're also going to um, narrow that digital divide, but student achievement uh, divide. You know, people call it the achievement gap, I call it the opportunity gap but this is a tool to, to narrow that gap. So I know we're talking a lot and appropriately so about the immediate crisis that our children are facing, but this has been an ongoing crisis um, as far as the digital divide, and this is going to allow us to narrow that divide and the student achievement gap faster because we can do more learning uh, outside of the classroom. Okay, most of the questions that had come in from reporters have been addressed uh, pretty substantially, but there are a couple of questions, um, one that may not have been fully addressed from Vicki Thomas at WWJ. Uh, someone spoke through earlier how the progression happened as far as uh, this all coming together, but when, when did it actually first begin? Do you remember roughly what date it was? And to give us a sense as to how many days, weeks, months it took to actually pull it together? I would say three to four weeks, Bill. Oh, if you could, I'm sorry, hang on for just one second. I think we're going to have to, okay. Uh, we can take one second to switch a mic line, and then you can do that. Okay. 
I would say it was uh, three to four weeks ago that uh, Reverend Anthony and I had our first conversation. Uh, and immediately after that, uh, I called my uh, great friend Bill Emerson and uh, Tanya Allen at Skillman. And that's how really the conversation started. And uh, it was hours, not days or weeks or months. I would say this is a project where typically it could take a year or two to pull off, to get everybody aligned and then to execute. Well, we're here in three or four weeks, and uh, the order for the tablets is placed, and they'll be shipped uh, shortly. Okay, and uh, Vicki also wanted to know whether uh, there were any thoughts about, you know, do we wish that this could have happened, or did it need to take a pandemic uh, to initiate a, a program like this? I don't know. We... Thank you, Vicki, for that question. <laughs> but let me just say this. Out of chaos comes construction and creativity. And whether it was a coronavirus issue or some other issue, the reality is that this is the reality. And we're all blessed and the children will be blessed. And so what we've done is seize the opportunity. There's an expression that weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. So we've been weeping because of coronavirus illness and COVID-19. And now on this morning, we have joy. That joy lies in the ability to provide this opportunity for thousands and thousands and thousands of children in the city of Detroit and their parents. And it's going to take us to another level. So, you know, it, we are wise to be able to, to let COVID not take us down, but COVID has been um, a a stumbling block that has really caused us to stand up. And so, come on COVID, we're making you disappear. Because out of this, we won't be known for 2020 in Detroit, the COVID illness, we'll be known in 2020 Detroit for the time that we hooked up and gave our children a future. Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions for Dr. Vitti uh, from WDET. A reporter would like to know, as you prepare for changes to the statewide K-12 budget next year because of the cost of responding to coronavirus, uh, what kind of plans, if any, are uh, the district making to secure uh, corporate and philanthropic support for schools in the future? That's yeah, a, uh, a relevant question. Uh, and this is actually part of the conversation that uh, why this investment was so important. Uh, we are likely to face a uh, reduction in funding uh, at the K-12 level throughout the country uh, and in Michigan. Uh, I'm hoping the legislature uh, will continue to prioritize education despite the loss of revenue. Every budget is about priorities and, and we're hoping that uh, the legislature, despite probably having to make difficult decisions, will continue to prioritize uh, education to minimize the reduction. But part of the conversation that we were all having uh, in, that, that's on this, um, in front of the podiums was how, what kind of investment do we need to make that's a short-term but a long-term investment. Uh, there is federal CARES Act funding that will be coming to the school district that's really one-time money. And that is likely to be used to fill the state budget gap so that we can continue to usher the reform forward uh, as a school district. We've, we've accomplished a lot in three years and our children need so much more, but without that CARES money filling in gaps, we're gonna have to cut programming. And this investment allows us to, uh, allow students and families to be connected to the internet devices and continue learning. State budget cuts come, we can use the CARES Act funding to fill that gap so that we can continue the other programming, continue the employment of all of our teachers, our support staff uh, in this crisis. So that's how we're looking at it right now is that it's about continuing the momentum uh, of reform and not taking a step back. And this investment uh, allows us to move forward as far as teaching and learning, connectivity, uh, but it also allows us to move forward in the context of state budget cuts. If that's okay, and then uh, two final questions come from uh, ML Elric at the Detroit Free Press. Wanted to know, first of all, will there be any sort of a, a help desk for students who may need some support from the technical standpoint, and what can be done to ensure that the equipment is returned to the district when it needs to be? 
Yeah, so so the, to clarify, this investment, this device is, the, is now going to be in the ownership of families and students. It is not the property of DPSCD. So once we issue the tablet, that tablet belongs to the family and, and to the student. Uh, and so um, as we problem solve with families, we're going to partner as a school district with uh, Human IT, uh, which is a, uh, a city resource uh, nonprofit to build the capacity of parents, problem solve with parents uh, as we move forward, because we also want this to be part of a citywide connectivity strategy to better resource our families. Okay, thank you all very much. This was the last question uh, for this portion of the program. Uh, so now what we'll do is transition. Uh, everyone here can uh, move along. And we, again, we thank you for your support in making this happen. Uh, and now uh, Mayor Duggan will stay and take any questions that we may have regarding the city's COVID-19 response. Well, a special thank you again. I wish there was a crowd here to give the applause that this group deserves. It, it's been remarkable. And with that, uh, I'll answer uh, any other questions you might have. Um, hi, Mr. Mayor. Um, if you could just give us an update regarding the nursing home initiative. Um, it was supposed to conclude today. Right. Is it still on target to Yes, you? we're in the last nursing homes right now. Uh, all 2,000 nursing home residents in the city of Detroit will have been tested along with a large number of nursing home staff uh, by this afternoon. So at this point, is it, do you have any um, percentages of how many people have, you know, any updates regarding numbers? Yeah, it, it's it's going to be about the same. So about, about one out of four people staying in nursing homes have been positive for COVID-19. Uh, and we'll see what the final um, death statistics are, but they're going to be terrible. I mean, there's one out of 10 or one out of 12 of the nursing home residents in this city. I suspect when the numbers are done, uh, will have died of, of COVID-19. It really drives home the point of why this country needs rapid testing. Uh, but in the last 10 days, I think the nursing homes have done a really good job of isolating the infectious uh, now that they have the 50-minute test. When will you have that final report? So my intention is to circulate it to all of the nursing homes on Monday uh, to make sure the data is right and release it publicly uh, on Tuesday. And, and our intention is to give you each individual, one of the 26 nursing homes, uh, what have been the number of infected residents and what have been the number of deaths from each home. And so I want to make sure, I want to give the nursing homes a chance on Monday to correct any inaccurate data and then we'll release it to everybody on Tuesday. Thank you. Hey, Mary Duggan, Larry Sproul, WDW Local 4. Um, Governor Whitmer issued, well, hinted at possibly extending the, uh, the stay-at-home ban. What's your thoughts about that, and is that applicable to the city of Detroit yeah, as well? I, th I think the governor has done a good job every step of the way. Uh, she's operating off of data, which is a great thing. Um, we are seeing a trend down in deaths since April 14th. We're going to release numbers today that are going to look like it's spiked, but it's this same thing. Dr. Caldoun is doing everything she can to clean up the data. But I saw today we reported a dozen deaths from March that are going to show up in today's numbers. And so I've asked the team by tomorrow to give you numbers that are actually meaningful so you can see what day each of the fatalities occurred and so you can see the trend line. But what that trend line will show is that since April 14th, um, we've been trending uh, in the right direction uh, here in the city. Are you concerned that the state and the city of Detroit could open uh, back up too soon or a second wave could be coming? Again, I, I, I am obsessed with the medical data, uh, and we will not do anything that isn't dictated by uh, the science. And so right now, I'm actually engaged with a number of the operations, uh, and we went through draft um, plans today for the medical uh, review required to bring people back. I'm hoping to have our essential infrastructure folks who do the parks, the roads, the water department back in the next couple of weeks. But as I, I said again to the team today, we're not bringing anybody back until you can show me that we have the proper medical screening before they come back and also the proper procedures uh, after they start work. Ultimately, I think those same practices will get rolled out 
uh, to private businesses. So uh, we're not going to do anything other than what's dictated by the science in the city of Detroit. Given the uh, fatality rate of African Americans in this country uh, from COVID-19, uh, we're going to take every reasonable precaution before we open up. Thank you. Thank